Okay. Great. I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. So welcome to uh, today's webinar about five ways that customer experience journey mapping can improve CSAT and NPS results. And I want to welcome all of you to today's webinar. And just mention as well, for those of you that are watching the webinar, you can also type in comments uh, in the chat window or in the Q&A window. So either one of those windows that's available on the webinar platform, you can actually type in any kind of questions or comments that you have. And we will have a question and answer session at the end of today's session. So it runs until two o'clock. And for the last few minutes, we'll have a question and answer session. We can actually you know, read off those questions that, that, that you send in. And I want to mention as well for today's webinar that uh, in terms of doing this, I want to just thank the, uh, the guest expert that we have, which is Annette Franz. And Annette, thank you very much for being a part of this webinar. And we're definitely looking forward to thank hearing more me. about the, oh, you're very welcome. And we're looking forward to hearing more about the customer experience journey as well. I also want to briefly talk a bit more about this at the end. Also thank our sponsors. Uh, thank 8x8 in terms of being able to provide sponsorship for this. And 8x8, of course, is a wonderful uh, you know, video uh, provider of video and live chat and also Cloud Contact Center as well. So one of the leading providers of that kind of technology to help with customer interfacing and customer experience. And I also want to thank Intelligence, which is a great leading you know, implementer as well of Cloud, Cloud Contact Center technology. And thank them for all their support in making this possible in terms of going forward with this. And again, we'll, we'll find a bit more about that at the end of today's session. First, I want to turn things over to Annette. And uh, Annette, I'm going to mention a bit about yourself in just a moment. So I just want to mention to Annette, thank you very much for being a part of this webinar and for sharing your experience. I've been following you for years on LinkedIn and Twitter in terms of your CX Journey blog and, and all the information that you put down on it. And it just, I'm just really fascinated to find out about what you have to say about how that impacts CSAT and MPS going forward. So Annette, I'll turn this over to you and you can tell us a little bit about yourself and about what your customer experience journey tips are for us. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I am going to share my slides here and we'll get started and uh, we should be in presentation mode now. Yep, awesome. I can see you right now. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. I am going to get started here and I was just going to turn off my video, but can't see how I'm doing that right now. So we'll just leave it for now and I'll figure it out in, in just a minute. Um, okay, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, a little bit about myself. I have been in this customer experience space for 25-ish uh, years. <laughs> uh, started my career at JD Power and Associates back in the early 90s. And today I am a founder and CEO of CX Journey Inc started my own uh, consulting firm just a couple of years ago and really excited about the things that I'm doing within um, within the scope of the work that I'm doing. I'm also co-founder of a customer experience accelerator called Insight Wave, which is a, a fun um, membership program to help uh, CX leaders really accelerate the work that they're doing today. And there, you guys can read the things that are on the slide here. I hate talking about myself. Mike and I already uh, talked about that earlier. No, nobody likes to talk about themselves. But um, vice chair of the Customer Experience Professional Association, uh, CCXD uh, Certified Customer Experience Professional, and a lot of other great things that I've been uh, doing over the years. So, so thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate um, being a part of this webinar. Really appreciate uh, the invitation to do this and to talk about really my favorite topic, um, customer experience and customer journey mapping or uh, journey mapping in general. So really excited about that. So um, well, let me go ahead and get started and I just am going to um, hide my video here for a second and let you guys just really focus on the slides. So uh, we'll come back on video here um, toward the end of the, the session here when we go through the Q&A. So I always like to start um, my presentations with the definition of customer experience. What is customer experience? It's the sum of all the interactions that a customer has with an organization over the life of the relationship with that company. And that includes product and price. There's a lot of debate about whether product and price are part of the experience and 110%. If you think about it, you will, will come to that realization that, yeah, why wouldn't they be, right? So, and then really more importantly, the feelings, the emotions, and the perceptions that the customer has about those interactions. Um, and again, I like to talk about these things because I like to get everybody on the same page about what customer experience is. Uh, let's see, I am not able to advance my slides with my page down, but hang on a second, what's going on here? All right, why are we stuck? Let's try that, okay, there we go. All right, sorry about that. Um, all right, so uh, what is a great customer experience? You know, we talk about customer experience, but it's always nice to know what are customers' expectations. And obviously we know those expectations are evolving every day, every minute, right? Just because of a variety of factors. But really a great customer experience comes down to this. It's one that is personal and personalized. It's relevant to the customer. It's consistent. Of, 
from interaction to interaction, from um, day to day, from uh, business unit to business unit, it's, it's consistent and it's seamless and it's easy, it's convenient, it's emotional and it's memorable. And these last two points are really, um, really good ones because that memory, that memorable experience, that's what gets people talking about your brand. That's what gets them to buy again. That's what gets them to use again. That's what gets them to tell stories about the experience that they had. So those are really key for the experience. But I can't talk about what customer experience is without talking about what it is not. So customer experience is not customer service, it's not customer care, and it's not customer success, right? Those are all part of, you know, they all fall underneath the umbrella of customer experience, but that is not what customer experience is. And, and I love to use this quote from Chris Zane with Zane Cycles to differentiate between customer service, for example, and customer experience. He says, customer service is what happens when the experience breaks down. And usually when I say that, people go, ah, I get it. Aha, that makes sense. So customer service is what happens when the experience breaks down. Customer experience is also not technology, right? Technology is a tool and a facilitator of the experience, but it is not the experience itself, right? There is no emotion or, or perception or feeling um, with technology, right? Um, and then finally, customer experience is not just about the front line. There's this mis misconception that the customer experience happens at the front line. But if you think about it, the customer experience is also very heavily impacted by, by what happens by your back office folks, right? They're the ones who are designing the products, they're the ones who are designing and, and, and creating your invoices and those kinds of things. So you have to think about that and realize that it's not just the front line that delivers that customer experience. All right, so why do we focus on customer experience? I'm gonna take a couple of slides here just to do a little bit of background on this, and then I promise you it will lead right into um, today's topic. I think this is really important to set the stage for what we'll be talking about. So in, in this world where products and services and everything is becoming more and more commoditized every day, customer experience is really the one true differentiator. We know that customers are willing to pay more for a better experience. So that means that really price comes off the table as a differentiator, right? So customer experience is really that one true differentiator. Brands really have to take the time to understand their customers, the problems that they're trying to solve, their pain points, the jobs they're trying to do, their expectations, and then they have to deliver against them. They have to deliver a great experience. Look at, looking at this slide, you can see the percentage of customers who avoid a brand because of a bad experience is, is huge. 70% for millennials, 68% for Gen Z, 65% for Gen X. It's crazy. So you've got to deliver a great experience or you can meet your fate. So this slide, you guys know all of these brands. You guys know all of these stories. It's not technology at the root of what killed these industries or killed these brands um, that, that these very cool brands whose icons I'm showing here um, or logos are, I'm showing here have um, killed. It's really the fact that in those industries, nobody was, uh, they weren't focusing on the customer and what the customer wants. I use Apple Music for example, right? Apple didn't kill the music industry. We as customers wanted one song off an album that cost $15, one song. And that was not possible. We had to spend $15 to, um, to get the song that we wanted to listen to. So Apple created Apple Music, which, you know, as we know, we can download whatever song we want. We don't have to buy the whole album. So the point here is that it's really all about the customer. Why are we in business? What's the purpose, right? And the purpose of a business, as Drucker said, is to create and to nurture a customer. It's all about the customer. Everything we do, it's why we're in business. And I love this slide. The struggle is real though, right? This is a, <laughs> a webinar that I did last year, that I, attend, sorry, that I attended last year. In the Q&A session, somebody asked, but if I focus on the customer, won't that take away from my focus on the product? And that's the kind of question that, you know, as a customer experience professional, makes you want to slam your head against the wall and go, what are they thinking? It's all about the customer. Who are they developing this product for, if not for the customer, if we're not focusing on the customer needs? So here's a classic example of that. Product focus versus customer focus. We all know the bottle on the left-hand side, right? This is all about designing the product and focusing on the product. 
Um, there's even a commercial about this bottle, right? <laughs> there's a commercial about this bottle, and your earworm for today is that song, Anticipation. It's making me wait. I, I challenge you to go and look up that, that commercial and to not have that song buzzing in your head all day long. But the bottle on the right is an example of designing for the customer, right? The one on the left, we sat there for minutes waiting or trying to slamming the back of the bottle, trying to figure out how to get the ketchup out of the bottle. The bottle on the right, we squeeze the bottle and, and we have ketchup in two seconds, you know? So that's the difference. I, I love this. This is an iconic example of how when you focus on the product versus focusing on the customer and, and, and the customer problem. All right, and one final thought on this line of thinking. Executives think that they're focusing on the customer and the customer experience, but they're really not. This is a classic example too. This is research that Bain did back in 2005. The numbers are still, you know, even though it's, it's almost 15 years old, the numbers are still pretty relevant and pretty consistent to what we're seeing today. Maybe they've shifted a little bit, but the story is still the same, right? They call this the delivery gap. I call it the CX perception gap. 80% of executives believe that they're delivering a superior experience, but only 8% of customers agree. So what's happening here? Well, there's two things that that gap exists, right? The first one is that um, when we focus on acquisition and when we focus on growth, we do different things and we do things differently than when we focus on retention and the customer experience. When we focus on growth and acquisition, you know, the CEO is going, hey, we brought in a million new customers last month. We, we must be having, we must have a great experience. Why else would these customers come to us? But then we don't do anything to keep them. And so that's the difference, right? They're, we're really not focusing on the experience. It's a whole different um, perspective. The second thing is that companies focus on data and analyzing that ad nauseum, and they focus on the metrics. And when we focus on the metrics, we're not focusing on the customer or the customer experience. And to that point, I love this quote from Simon Sinek, focus on the vision and the numbers will thrive. Focus on the numbers and the vision will struggle. So this is, a, this is, uh, this is exactly what happens. When we focus on the metrics, we do things differently than if we're focusing on what it takes to improve the customer experience. When we focus on the metrics, and you've all, <laughs> you've all been a part of this, you've all been on the receiving end of this, somebody says, here's a free candy bar if you'll give me a five out of five, or, Here's a free oil change or a free Sam's Club membership, and those are all things that I've gotten, right? If you give me a five, if you don't give me a five out of five or a 10 out of 10 on the survey you're gonna get, then I'm gonna get fired. You know, that's focusing on the metrics. Those businesses are not focusing on the experience. So that's the difference, right? That's what happens when we focus on the metrics. So what we need to do is we really need to shift the thinking and put the customer into the customer experience, right? We've got to not focus on the metrics. We've got to focus on what it takes to put the customer in. And, and the way to do that, any improvements or any transformation that we, we embark on has to be grounded in customer understanding, in, in data, and in insights. Because customer understanding really is the cornerstone of customer centricity, and this is what we're talking about. We're talking about putting the customer at the heart of everything that we do. And you have to remember, too, that great experiences, they don't just happen. They're planned. They're deliberate. You have to take the time to understand your customers and their needs and their expectations and then design an experience to deliver against those. So how do we do that? How do we achieve customer understanding? Well, there's three sort of key ways. The three key ways that I talk about are to listen, to characterize, and to empathize. Listening is all about surveys, feedback online reviews, those kinds of things. How do we get feedback from our customers to tell us, you know, their, their pain points, their expectations, and how well we're delivering against those? That's what Listen is all about. Characterize is all about developing personas, right? It's all about, it's a research-based personification of, of groupings of customers who have similar or like pain points, problems they're trying to solve, jobs that they're trying to do, um, tasks that they're trying to achieve. Those groupings allow us to design a better experience for those specific needs and jobs, et cetera, et cetera. We can't focus on target customers or target demographics. It's too high level. We're never going to really meet our customers' needs and their expectations by designing at that high level, which is why we develop personas. And the third thing is empathize. Empathize is all about walking in our customer's shoes and understanding what their experience is like today so that we can design the experience for tomorrow. 
And that's what I'm going to talk about today. That is all about journey mapping. Now, journey mapping is uh, I'm looking forward to you. at the end of at the end of the uh, session here. We'll have a poll uh, to ask about your journey mapping experience. I'm going to just assume right now that some of you may have mapped and some of you may not have. And so I'll kind of step back and talk about what it is. Journey mapping is really this creative process that helps you understand the experience like you seriously like you've never understood it before because what ends up happening is we're going to illustrate the steps that the customer takes as they interact with the brand from some point A to point B some interaction and capture a timeline of what the customer is doing thinking and feeling throughout each interaction and it tells the story of the customer journey and more importantly this is the empathize part right we build empathy for her for her experience for her for her what she's trying to do right what problem she's trying to solve and then we you know it, journey mapping allows us to then identify those gaps and areas for improvement and then co-create a better experience with our customers for the future so this is this is what journey mapping is so i'm really excited to uh, talk about you know this topic as as I mentioned at, at the beginning I'm, I'm honored to be invited to do this um, webinar the one thing that I will say here is that the title of the webinar is five ways journey mapping can improve NPS and CSAT results but given what I just went through given what I just talked about we're not going to focus on the metrics right we're going to focus on improving the customer experience and the metrics will follow so i'm not going to talk about the metrics for the next several slides right i'm going to talk about what we need to do to improve the customer experience because once we do that the metrics will come the metrics will follow right so let me take you through those five ways the first way that journey mapping can help us um, improve the customer experience is it helps us to really understand the current state experience today and in order to do that and, and in order to do that we've got to obviously map the current state with our customers this is all about the customer it's all about their perspective what is your experience today pick some point a to point b pick some interaction and let's walk through the steps step by step what are you doing thinking and feeling along that journey along that through that throughout that experience now there are a lot of different frameworks and a lot of different ways that you can map but the most important things you're going to capture are what is the customer doing, what is the customer thinking, and what is the customer feeling. And when I tell clients about the feeling thing, the eyes start rolling. But let me tell you, that's really where we build empathy for our customers, right? When we really understand how we make them feel. And I've been in journey mapping workshops where my clients will go, oh my gosh, I can't believe we made them feel like we didn't care, that we frustrated them. We, I can't believe we made them feel that way. So that's a really important thing. The other thing that I want to note here is that Journey mapping and customer lifecycle mapping are not the same thing. If you're mapping and your map has, you know, as your columns across the top, you know, need, awareness, consideration, selection, you're not journey mapping. You're creating a lifecycle map and maybe a touch point map. Journey mapping is step by step. What did the customer do? You know, they decided to go get some coffee from the moment they needed coffee to the moment they got their coffee and maybe even beyond what were the steps that they went through to do that so that's how that's the level of detail that you've got to capture otherwise you're not really going to understand what the current state experience is today you're also going to bring data and artifacts into the map that's going to help you bring the map to life and i'll talk more about that in just a second and then the next thing you're going to need to do is prioritize the moments of truth the maps themselves don't prioritize the moments of truth or, or even identify the moments of truth you've got to bring data into the map to do that so let me talk a little bit about the data that you want to bring into the map and why you want to do that. First of all, when, whenever we bring data into anything we do, it helps us to understand, it makes it more actionable. It also turns the map from more qualitative to quantitative because now you know, we've mapped in a room with customers, they told us what they're doing, thinking and feeling, but now we can add that quantitative uh, aspect to it and say you know what the 10 customers we had in the room felt this way but here are here's feedback from 500 more who at you know along this journey had the same pain points and here's the data to show it so the different types of data that we can bring into the into the maps includes obviously feedback from your surveys or wherever you've gotten customer feedback right and then that emotional data that emotional data is often going to come from your verbatims and your sentiment analysis come, could come from uh, some of the quantitative um, type closed-in type questions that you ask on your survey as well 
you're also going to bring persona data into the maps, right? The persona is going to be a part of the map, but some of the research that you've done around, you know, developing those personas is going to add a lot of color and color commentary to the, to the maps as well and to the experience. And you're going to bring in your metric. This is where you're going to bring in, you know, maybe your NPS, your, your customer satisfaction, or your customer effort score. Thinking about, you know, like a call to a call center and, and waiting online for the customer service rep to answer the phone or to help you or whatever. Customer effort store, score is a great score to bring into those kinds of maps to really identify what were the most painful and the, and the, the most difficult points along that journey for the customer. We can also bring in other, other kinds, of, kinds of customer data, so interaction and transaction and reason for the call, number of visits to the site, you know, where they went on the site, those kinds of things to, again, add more detail and more actionability to the map, make the maps more actionable. We'll bring in operational metrics as well. Those operational metrics might be things around call volume and first call resolution and hold time, time to resolve, those kinds of things. Again, Putting that data along those points, along those steps uh, in the journey will help to bring um, that journey to life and help the organization better understand where those pain points are. We can also bring business data into the map. And the business data that I'm talking about is the thing that's going to help you prioritize those moments of truth, right? So the business data are things like, you know, um, cost to fix, time to fix, effort to fix, resources to fix impact to f impact if we fix these things impact on the customer and impact on the business so that's really important because you're going to need that to help you then analyze the map and prioritize those improvement opportunities and then the last thing you're going to bring in is artifacts artifacts are things like screenshots pictures video um, you know invoices those kinds of things again things that will showcase at each step along the journey, what the customer was interacting with or was using along that uh, for that interaction. So lots of um, lots of different data types that you want to bring into your map, and it is absolutely imperative that you bring data into the map because, like I said, it makes it actionable and allows you to analyze and, and determine the the points that you really want to start. You know, those moments of truth, those areas where you really want to start to um, improve the experience. All right, so still under the um, number one <laughs> way to use the maps to improve the experience is, uh, and still also around the current state experience, is to de de develop current state service blueprints. Um, and if you've never seen a service blueprint and don't know what that is, I'm gonna show you an example of one in here in just a minute here. But what happens with the service blueprints is that they allow you to identify the people, the tools, the system, the processes that support and facilitate the current state experience, that journey that the customer is having. I always say you can't fix what's happening on the outside, which is the customer's experience, if, unless you fix what's happening on the inside. And that's all of the tools and processes and systems and people and employee experience, all of those kinds of things that need to be fixed on the inside before you can fix what the customer is really experiencing. So having both the journey map and the service blueprint give you that nice end-to-end -end view of the journey and that surface to core view of what's happening. So it gives you a nice picture of the entire um, experience ecosystem. So if you've never seen a service blueprint, this is a great example of one. And it's the service blueprint is linked to the journey map that you just created. So if you look at this line here that says customer action, that's the, when I said we're mapping, doing, thinking, and feeling, that's the doing line. That's the steps the customer took to do, you know, to, to go from point A to point B in that interaction. So that's, that's the only line from the actual journey map that comes over into the, um, into the service blueprint because now what we want to do is along that journey, identify, and as we go down the, the blueprint here, identify the employees, the, the tools, the, you know, the processes, and all of those things that are happening behind the scenes to facilitate what's happening, uh, you know, what they call on stage or what the customer is experiencing. So that's a great example of a, of a um, and then we take that and we identify the pain points and areas that need to be fixed and figure out where we go from here. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So the second way that we um, use journey maps to improve the experience is to use them to design a, a better future experience, right? We use them to, as, as sort of a blueprint, for lack of a better word, of, 
what the new experience is going to be like. So what we do in step number two is we conduct future state mapping workshops with our customers. This is about really about ideating solutions for the current pain point for our customers and then ideating the ideal experience of the future, right? Um, and there are a lot of different approaches that you can use for ideating this great future um, experience for our customers. But this is, a, this is an interesting one that Airbnb uses. It's called What's Your 11 Star Experience? And I don't know if ever, but anybody's ever heard this before. And Mike, we can certainly share this with, uh, with the audience afterwards. Um, I'm happy to share the link on, on how Airbnb does this. But I'll run through it real quickly just so everybody has an idea of, of um, of what it is. So they typically start with a five-star experience. So they, they take a look at five, six, seven, 10, 11. What are those? How do we get to deliver an 11-star experience for a customer? So a five-star experience, and most of you have probably used an Airbnb before. Um, five-star experience, they say, is you knock on the door, your host actually answers the door. I haven't ever stayed at an Airbnb where the host was there to welcome me in. But in this particular five-star experience, they say your host is there to welcome you at the door. And, you know, hello, thanks for, thanks for coming and for staying here. That's a five-star experience. Six-star experience is the host welcomes you at the door. You come in. They have a welcome gift for you, a basket of wine and chocolate and snacks and those kinds of things. There's, frit, there's water in the fridge, toiletries in the bathroom, and, and, and more of those kinds of things. A seven-star experience is all of that, but when the host opens the door, there's also you know, hey, we've got a full kitchen. We've given you everything you need. We've done all your grocery shopping for you. <laughs> You've got everything there. And then, oh, by the way, we know you like to surf. So there's a surfboard over there in the corner. Take it, use it, go surf, have a great time. And by the way, here are the keys for my car. You can use my car too. <laughs> so that's a seven-star experience. Now they skip in, in this example, they skip over eight and nine and they go straight to 10 and they say, what does a 10-star experience look like? And again, we're sitting there in these ideation sessions and we're thinking, just throw, you know, pie in the sky, rainbows, like whatever you want. What is the, what is your, ideal experience like the craziest thing you can think of and the reason we do that is because we want people to think differently we want to take people in your office the people who actually design that experience and you go you know what that's crazy but it's not so crazy <laughs> or that's crazy but maybe we can do this instead so you know just to get people out of their comfort zone in terms of what they're thinking about and how they design experiences so the 10 star experience would be you land in the city where you've, you know, you've, you've uh, rented the Airbnb and you're greeted at the plane by 5,000 students who are cheering and welcoming you to the city or welcoming you to the country. You get to the Airbnb and there's a press conference at the front door waiting for you, right? <laughs> so that's a 10 star. 11 star experience is all of those things plus Elon Musk is standing there at your front door saying, we're going to space. So, so it's a crazy, again, it's crazy ideation. It's throwing out these fabulous ideas, but it's to get you to think differently. And when we do these sessions, what we do is we tell, we set expectations with the customers, obviously. We say, we're not going to be able to do everything that you tell us or that you, all your ideas. We know you've got fabulous ideas, but we're going to do as much as we can. We'll come back to you and we'll let you know what it, but you know, maybe there's some things in there that we can tweak or we can do some of. But, you know, we, we really want to just, again, get people to think differently and to do things differently. So we're going to do the same thing for the service blueprint as well. We're going to have uh, uh, future state service blueprint workshops with internal folks. They're going to ideate their, you know, the backstage and the behind the scenes processes and, and tools and systems and all of that. And then identify what it is that they'll need to, to in order to build and, and deliver that future state experience. And we design the future state. So that, this is actually a fun type of a workshop to do because people can kind of let their hair down and, and think outside the box, which is really the fun part of it. All right, so quick wrap up of those two first two steps. Current state maps, we use them to understand today's experience. Future state maps, we use them to design tomorrow's experience. And again, tomorrow's better experience. That's the key here. Current state maps are grounded in data, where future state maps are really grounded in creativity and ideals. Um, current state maps, we use them to identify pain points and, and high points, what's going well and what's not. Versus future state maps, we use them to ideate solutions for the pain points. Current state maps, we can identify listening gaps, and in future state maps, we then incorporate those listening posts as needed. For current state maps, we make incremental improvements until, because to design and, and, and to implement a future state 
experience takes time. It takes a lot of time. So if we can make some of those incremental improvements in the meantime, that'll hold us over until we've got this new experience designed and rolled out. So future state maps are really driven by the customer experience vision, which is a research-based, it's insights-driven, it's what is the ideal intended future experience that your customers desire? So that's what that's driven by. And then future state maps, rather than making incremental improvements, they are really all about designing and delivering new value for your customers. So that's how you're gonna um, improve the experience with those maps. So the third way that we're going to improve the experience is obviously we need to execute. <laughs> we've done a lot of work here, a lot of like prep work and setup work, but now we've actually got to put it to work. We've got to use it, right? So we're going to implement and activate this new experience and the maps actually become the blueprint for, for the work that needs to be done. So what we're going to do is we're going to prototype. We're going to test it with our customers and we're going to fail fast and we're going to do that. We're going to go through that cycle until we get our customers to say, yeah, this is the experience we want. This is, this is meeting our expectations or this makes us happy or this delights us, whatever, whatever that you know, word is that comes from their mouth. And then we launch and then we communicate, right? We've got to teach employees about the new systems, tools, processes that they're gonna to need to deliver the new experience. And we're gonna teach them about the new experience as well. And we're gonna close the loop with customers. And I think this is a good segue to step number four, the, the fourth way to use the maps to um, improve the experience is communication and training. This is actually one of the most important principles of journey mapping. Journey maps have to be um, communicated, shared, uh, updated, uh, collaborated. And so this is actually one of the most important tenets of, uh, of the journey map is that you, they can't just be rolled up and shoved in a closet somewhere. You've got to share them and communicate them so that employees understand the experience today and they can learn about the experience that they do need to design for the future or that they need to deliver, I should say, for the future. So we're, we use the maps for onboarding, we use the maps for training. We use the maps for ongoing education. We use the maps to unite the organization around the customer, right? To teach them about the current and the future state, to really ingrain that customer-centric culture in the business and to develop, really to develop empathy for the customer. One of the things that I like to talk about at this point when we talk about communication and training and how the maps can be used is, is to put, to, store them, quote unquote, quote unquote, store them or showcase them in a customer room. And if you don't know what a customer room is, <laughs> I like to refer to it as a shrine to the customer, right? There's a dedicated room in your offices that is all about the customer, all about the customer experience. It typically uh, contains journey maps, customer feedback, the personas, feedback from the customers, those kinds of things, really focusing on the customer so that at any time of day or night, employees can walk in there and learn about who their customers are, what the experience is, and um, what customers are expecting. So this is a great, this is an important part of journey mapping, of why we map, and how we use the maps to improve the experience. And then finally, the fifth way that we use the maps to improve the experiences around aligning the organization around the customer. I think this is such a key thing as well. I've used maps with clients to get executive commitment for the customer experience transformation that they've got to do. It's an eye-opening experience for the executives and for the CEO to see, oh my goodness, this is what we put our customers through. We need to fix this. Uh, we use the maps to get organizational adoption. We do, we, same thing. We take the maps out to share with employees and say, wow, wow, that's really painful. Why do we do that to our customers? You know, We use the maps to connect and to break down silos. When we map, and the, one of the ways that we do this is when we map, we've got cross-functional representation um, among the stakeholders in the room uh, when we're mapping. And then there's got to be that cross-functional stakeholder representation moving forward as we implement and, and as we, you know, root cause analysis and break down why those moments of truth, where, where, the, where the root cause is of that, where it's happening upstream so that we can fix things downstream. So this is a really important um, part of why we use the maps. The other thing is we use it to provide a clear line of sight to the customer. I've already talked about this. You know, it's not just the front line delivering, it's the back office. We show the back office, the, the journey map with the service blueprint, they can very quickly and very readily see how they impact the customer experience. We use the map to develop empathy for the customer. And then we also, this is an important piece, to identify and align the hiring and training that we need internally to match our customers' needs and expectations. So that's a really important piece of that. 
so really, you know, the bottom line is that the maps help get everyone focused on the customer, the customer experience, and their individual roles in making the experience happen. So I think that's really a key thing here. So we've gone through the five things that, that um, are the five different ways that you can use maps to um, improve your metrics <laughs> by first improving the customer experience. So I'm wondering, um, like, do we have the poll set up? Can we, um, can we share the poll with attendees and get them to answer this question if they've ever used the maps for any of these five things? Well, we actually have them raise their hands. So on their okay. window, oh, sort of in the top, almost on the left-hand side of the very top bar of the window, there should be a little button there that says raise hand. And so when that asks a question, if you raise your hand, we can actually see the results. I see, I see one person's already raised their hand. Okay, good. So Annette, you can ask a question, and then we'll give it a moment, then I can okay. actually count off and tell you how many people have raised their hands on here. Okay, so let, the question is, do you use the journey maps for any of the five things mentioned, um, mentioned that I've already mentioned, but they're listed here below? Um, if so, which one? So understand customer, uh, I'm sorry, understand current state experiences, design future state experiences, implement new experiences so they're, they've become the blueprint for that new experience, communication and training, or aligning the organization. Um, so I would, I, I guess the first question would be, have you used the maps for any of those five? And then maybe the second question that we ask is, have, well, maybe the first question should be, have you ever mapped? <laughs> and then we can exclude those folks. But So let's okay. start with, have you ever mapped? Let's, let's start with that one. Perfect. Okay, good. So if you've mapped, please raise your hand. Click the raise your hand button, top left-hand corner. Uh, there we've got six people, six hands up so far, seven now, so far. Awesome. Okay, I'll just give it a few more seconds, and I'll give you the total number. All right, so 10 hands now. Okay, very good. So we had 10 hands, actually. People raised their hands saying they've done that. Nice. All right, I like it. All right, so then I would just ask, of those 10, have you used them for any of those five things that I just mentioned, or have you just mapped and then you were done? So have you used them for any of the five things that I just went through? Okay, perfect. We've got a couple of hands up already, and four now. And I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay. Five, mm -hmm. six, seven. Okay, so we've got seven so far who said they've uh, used okay. it. You know what? That is awesome. You know what? If you used the maps for any of these things, right, I would actually move beyond just understanding because sometimes I think that's where they get stuck. People use the maps to understand the current experience but then do nothing with it. So I would say if you've used the maps for any of the other four things, then you are well on your way to on the CX maturity curve, right, and are doing a lot of other things right as well, most likely. So, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. All right, one more slide um, real quickly. Um, I know we have just a few minutes, about five minutes, so I'll go through this real quickly and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. So one of the things that I wanted to do, just real quickly, we don't have time in this, um, on this webinar to talk about how to map and, and how to do it right, but my focus with my clients last year and this year has really been how do we take the map from, you know, and go from maps to outcomes. And these are the six steps. I'll just talk through them at high level. I've already talked about some of these things, but I think we need to get these right in order for you to be, because there are so many headlines about journey maps a waste of time, journey maps have failed, the, you know, how many people are not seeing the results from mapping. And it's really because they get viewed as a tool and not as a process. And you've really got to abide by this process in order to, um, to see the success that you're hoping to see out of them. So the first thing is planning. I mean, it's, it's planning 101, right? Fail to plan, plan to fail. And so really during this step, step, you've got to do all the prep work, right? You need to identify the personas you're gonna map for, the scope of the map, that point A to point B, who's gonna be in the room, which customers are going to attend, what are your objectives, what are your desired outcomes, what are the success, all of those things, like basic project planning kind of, kind of stuff in this, in this first step. The second step is empathize, and that's where we go in and we map. And there's a lot of detail that I could talk about in about the mapping workshop, but we've got five minutes, not five hours. So I'll just say right now that we need to make sure that there's customers in the room, that we're mapping what the customers are doing, thinking, and feeling, that we bring data in, we bring those artifacts in, and we really adhere to the general rules of mapping. And, and if anybody has questions about what those are, I'm happy to share those with you afterwards. Um, so our third step is introspect. This is all about looking inward. This is about the service blueprint. Again, it, you can't fix what's happening on the outside if you don't fix what's happening on the inside. So this is a really important piece. 
the next step is to identify. And this is about, you know, once you've brought the data into the maps, you've got to identify your moments of truth, prioritize those moments of truth, conduct root cause analysis, really identify what the root cause is of the issues and the pain points for your customers. The next step is that ideation that, that we talked about, developing those future state um, journey maps and the future state service blueprints, uh, the ideation session, really getting people to think differently and to think about how to deliver a better experience. Really, what we're, what we're after here and why some of these um, transformations fail or stall or whatever is we've got to think disruptively, right? How do we deliver the Amazon effect experience of our industry, of our business, right? What do we have to do differently? And then finally implement, you know, don't stop short of doing the work. You've got to do the work. You've got to implement the new experience, educate your customers, I'm sorry, educate your employees on what that new experience is and how they're going to deliver it and communicate with your customers, close the loop with your customers and let them know what to expect with the new experience. Um, so with that, that's really the bottom line for how you're going to improve your um, metrics, is you're going to improve the experience. You're going to do the things that I just talked about, map the experience, create the service blueprint, ideate, develop that future state map and blueprint, do the work, train your employees, share the maps and keep them updated, and really just focus on the customer. This is what it's all about, focusing on the customer, and the metrics will come. And with that, Mike, I, uh, I will turn it over to you. I thank you again for having me in this webinar, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Happy to take questions if you've got any. Okay, great. And Annette, thank you very much as well. We've got some great questions for you from the audience, uh, some, some really terrific ones. Uh, the first one is in looking in terms of um, uh, the presentation itself. And so just this one I can actually talk about is we will have the presentation available. So we'll actually send out a link to everyone who signed up, both those of you that are here right now, as well as anybody else who missed it, we'll actually send a link out in a few days, which will actually link to a YouTube version of the actual webinar. So you can see all the slides, all the Q&A, et cetera. It'll all be available for people out there. And now, Annette, the first question I've got for you, this is from uh, Constantinos in Italy. And his question for you is, why do you think it's more difficult to build loyalty in B2B? And, you know, why most of them haven't adapted a customer experience strategy so far? Well, you know, that's actually an interesting question, and it's a conversation that I have with many folks, the difference between B2B and B2C and, and why it's such a challenge. And I think there's sort of this stigma or this historical, B2B doesn't have to focus on a customer experience. We've got co contracts, we've got corporate directives, we've got, you know, X, Y, and Z, but that's just not the case anymore. The B2B experience, we're all, you know, even as B2B, we're all B2C customers as the employees we want to, we have expectations about the experience that we have not only when we're out there as customers, but when we're in, sitting in at our desks for our employers and interacting with a vendor or interacting with a client or whoever, we want to deliver a, a great experience there as well. So the thinking has actually shifted quite a bit. Most of my clients are B2B and I love working with B2B clients. There, there's um, a real openness to figuring out why the experience is what it is today and to fixing it. So um, I don't, you know, the, the challenge with loyalty, going back to the first part of your question, the challenge with loyalty has been around those corporate directives. And we have a, we've signed a three-year, a five-year contract, but those contracts will end. And if you treat your, um, if you treat your vendors like dirt, and if they treat you like dirt, you're not going to continue. So it's more of a long game when it comes to B2B, but it's still a very important area of focus, focus on your customers. Okay, great, and that's perfect. And I've got a question from Georgina, which is, um, how have you prototyped before, apart from digital? Uh, I, I, how have I prototyped? Yeah, is that, um, I, is that, is that map the, aside from digital or is that the actual prototyping workshops when we're um, prototyping the experience? If we're prototyping the experience, it's not, it doesn't have to all be digital, right? You can actually develop, you can mock up the prototypes in, you know, physical examples, analog <laughs> examples for Lego, and use those to, um, to test the experience. It depends on what the actual um, aspect of the experiences that you're trying to solve. It may be digital, but you can certainly develop analog prototypes to 
um, to test with your customers as well. And as for the maps, if the question was about the maps themselves, I actually like to start mapping with butcher paper and post-it notes because it's such a creative process. It gets people out of their chairs and really thinking um, and asking questions and, and questioning each other. And you know, this, so it's a very creative process, but once that part is done, I do like to take the maps and digitize them because, again, to adhere to those rules that I was talking about for mapping, you've got to, you know, share them, you've got to collaborate, you've got to add the data. You can't add data to a, to a um, butcher paper and post-it notes. You've got to be able to do that. And a lot of the digital platforms also offer, you know, sort of action planning and action management type features and functionality, which then... Uh, allows you to collaborate internally in terms of next steps and developing your plans for how you're going to um, act on what you've learned. Okay, great. And, and you're also the follow-up question as well, which is, uh, do you find that customers can't I, uh, ideate on the current state very well, mm -hmm. as they can describe what they want, but not the experience itself? Um, you know what? I, I, no, actually, no. And it's interesting because, <laughs> you know, the, they can. They absolutely can ideate. They don't have any problems with really thinking about what experience they would like to have. But the interesting thing that I've discovered is, is even though I tell them, think pie in the sky, think rainbow, think whatever, you know, they really are pretty realistic in terms of what they want. Customers don't want you know, Elon Musk standing at the door telling him we're going to space. They don't want that, right? They just want things to be right and, and to be treated well and, and things to be done right for them. They don't need all the crazy things that I talked about. So, so no, they don't have problems ideating, but they're, what they want is just not what you would think. So the harder part for me is to get them to help my clients think outside the box and think differently. And that's where the challenge is. But customers themselves know exactly what it will take to delight them. And most of the time, it's very simple. And it's simply because brands aren't doing it at this point. It's very, very straightforward. Okay, good. Excellent. And I've got a question from Debbie. I'm going to follow up again about ideation, which is, uh, as a regular okay. practice, I include my clients in the ideation portion of the, of the journey mapping process, and they love it. Uh, they experience the pain points at an intimate level, and have often dreamt of the perfect solution. Why not give them the opportunity to come to the table with those ideas? I truly believe it further helps, us, helps keep us accountable as a company. So what are your thoughts on Absolutely. that, no, I, I totally agree. And again, it goes back to what I just said, right? You know, because customers aren't looking for the crazy things. They don't want to go to space. They want you to just meet their expectations, understand their expectations, right? And then meet those. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's yeah, well said, Debbie. Well said. Okay, good. And, and a question as well. So for this, uh, this webinar, we actually don't have any kind of a participation certificate or graduation certificate, but do you have one that you offer in terms of as you share this information? You, you gave a lot of great information for people about the customer experience journey. Do you give some kind of participation certificate for this? Uh, it's a great question. You know, somebody else asked me that a couple of days ago, and I don't. Unfortunately, I don't. Oh, it's a great okay. idea, though. I love it. I, love I know it. I did too. I, I was thinking about that as well. Believe. Thank you for suggesting yep. that because you can take a look at yep, that for future awesome. webinars going forward. Yep. Um, I've got a question from uh, Raul, which is organizations that use independent retail channels mm -hmm. to sell their products. What would you? What would your suggestion be to include the variances of the retail experience in the journey maps? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that we didn't get into the details of mapping and specifically how to map, but I always. I always say, the, the, uh, you know, some of that's going to be captured by the customer. The customer is going to know some of the different channels. And if it's not something that's apparent to the customers, we're going to capture it in the blueprint. But I always tell my clients when we map, and, and, and I tell the customers when they're customers, when they're in those mapping workshops, think about the things that are outside of, of the immediate control. Think about things that are not um, you know, and I'll use a, I'll use a coffee shop example, and I know it's not specific to this question, but when you go to the coffee shop, right, you drive to the coffee shop, you have to park, you've got to do all these things. And a lot of the, a lot of that it, it has nothing to do with the shop itself. But the reason that we need to know it is so that we can mitigate those things because the customer walks into the coffee shop and the customer is upset already because traffic was bad. There were no parking spots or any of that stuff. So, and if we understand that, when the customer walks in our door, we can then mitigate for those things. So, so having different, you know, disparate channels um, and that might not be direct, I, you have to capture all of those things because it is the full ecosystem. It impacts the customer's experience one way or the other. So, Okay, great, Annette. And, and one last question for you as well is, do I have to have a digital platform to map? Uh, what's the best format or way to map? 
Yeah, and and I think I and I think I just I, I mentioned that earlier. So I like to map with. Um, put your paper and post-it notes, but then you've got to digitize. You absolutely do because you've got to be able to, uh, again, collaborate, share, update. How are you going to update the maps? It's a pain to update maps that are put your paper and post-it notes. Um, so you've got to digitize it, which will simplify keeping the maps updated and updating those maps. Um, what was that? What was the last part of the question? I know there's one other part of the question that I'm that I'm missing. Oh, there, sorry, what was the, the best, last part? Sorry, what's the best way or format to map? Okay. Yeah. You know, again, I start with the butcher paper and post-it notes and then um, um, from there uh, transfer to a digital platform. And there are a ton of platforms out there. I actually um, wrote a, a blog post about this very topic uh, last week. And in that blog post, I've listed out a couple of sites that have t taken a look at the various um, uh, digital platforms that are out there and they've listed the pros and the cons and how much it costs and and some of the features and functionality of those things so take a look at that post and i'm happy to you know share it with um with you mike and the land intelligence team to send out with um the uh you know the recording and the and the presentation as well but um, I think there's some great information there. A lot of these um, companies have done a lot of work to sort of make those comparisons. I would not go with Visio. I would not go with PowerPoint. You cannot, again, a pain to update. You cannot add data to those things. You can't really collaborate with the, uh, on those in, in a way that's really, that really makes sense. So I would uh, take a look at some of these digital platforms. Okay, good. Excellent. And actually, I've got a couple of new questions that just popped in. Okay, we'll give a few awesome. minutes to go and, and, and follow. I'm glad to have so much audience participation, by the way. Thanks to everybody who's sending in questions. That's, it makes it very interactive as well. Uh, this was a question from Debbie again. Uh, this is about journey mapping, uh, the employee experience. The employee experience now is being talked about more frequently. Um, what are your thoughts in yeah. terms of uh, this practice, and how does it impact journey mapping as a whole? Thank you for planting that seed. <laughs> yes, that was one thing that I that I forgot to mention, which was journey mapping isn't just for customers. It's for employees. It's for vendors. It's for anybody who's having an experience with your with your brand that you want to ensure that they have a great experience. Franchisors with their franchisees, licensors and their licensees. You know those kinds of things. We've got to map everybody's experience. And absolutely, we know employee experience drives customer experience. So in order to ensure that our employees have a great experience. We go through the exact same steps, the exact same process that I went through um, on this, you know, on this webinar for customers. We go through the exact same thing for employees. One of the things that we know about the employee experience is it's not just the soft stuff um, that, you know, the development, the leadership, the communication, you know, the, the growth opportunities, the advancement, the coaching and the feedback. The employee experience is also about having the right tools, the processes and the procedures and the and the resources to do what they need to do. They tell me when I'm when I'm working with my clients, they tell me, I want to be able to serve my customers, but I can't because I don't have the right tools or the resources and the processes. So when we um, map the employee experience and we connect that with the customer experience map, it's, you know, great things happen, absolutely, because we can really um, ensure that they have a great experience that they can then uh, deliver a great experience for their customers. Oh, good. Okay, excellent. That sounds good. And a question from uh, Constantino. It's actually a second question from him, which is, okay. uh, you know, why do companies believe, or sorry, uh, why do companies talk about customer experience strategy, but in fact, they are not customer experience oriented. They design journey maps, but they're missing all the previous steps. Yeah. Um, the the question is why. That's a great question. If <laughs> if I had the answer to that, I'd be a, I'd be pretty darn rich. But I will say that. There's, again, there's this misconception. They focus on the things that they need to do to, uh, you know, acquire uh, customers and to grow their customer base. They focus on the things that they, um, that they need to do to improve the metrics, but they don't really focus on these things. And I think it's, a, it's it, they don't understand, right? They don't get it. There's, or that's just not, they don't, they don't care. You know, <laughs> I've seen that happen too. They just don't care. They really want to focus on profit, put profit first. So, but again, if I had the answer to that question, seriously, it would be, it would be pretty amazing because I, for me, it seems like a no brainer that we need to focus on the customer and do what's right for the customer. But um, some folks just don't get that. Okay. All right. Great. Well, hopefully more of them will get that message as, as you and, and you'll talk more so. about journey mapping as well <laughs> going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know what? Journey mapping is just a piece of it, right? And if they're already mapping and doing something with it, that's great. But it has to be a part of your bigger strategy. And if it's not part of the bigger strategy where you've got, you know, you've got a culture that's focused on 
uh, you know, the customer and customer centricity, if you don't have executive alignment around this, if, you, if you're not focusing on the employee experience, if you don't have a governance structure in place, if you're not doing some of the other things that have to be in place as a foundation for uh, your customer experience strategy, then you know what, you're just doing things in pockets that are little band-aids and it won't be seamless for your customers. They will feel it, they will know when they interact with uh, at the bank branch versus you know, at the, uh, digital. You know, the, the, they know the differences so, and, it, and they feel it and it's painful. Okay, well, that's a really important point as well. So, Annette, thank you so much for sharing all the information that you shared in the last hour with us and answer all the questions as well. It's really great to go and hear those you know, experiences that you have and insights that you have uh, uh, with that. And I also want to mention as well for everyone that, again, a copy of the webinar itself will be available in a few days so people can actually go back and, and, again, listen to what you had to go and say, see the slides again, and also, more importantly, share it with your teammates as well and share it with other people in their company, other touch points there to help spread your message, Annette, about customer experience and awesome. the whole customer experience <laughs> the more Yes, the more we can get the word out, the better, obviously. Yes, so thank you. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. And I just want to say just a few words in closing as well. Some thanks as well to, to yourself, Annette. I also want to thank as well 8x8 and Intelligence, who are just excellent in terms of being able to combine for cloud solutions and help businesses really be able to transform their customer and employee experience. We talked about both uh, you know, during the webinar itself. And they're a really great platform as well to, uh, to be able to help integrate these systems and a lot of cloud contact center to just make it easier to help fulfill you know, some of these promises going forward. And I also want to mention as well, too, we talked about the Q&A as well. So I just want to thank everybody in terms of being involved in this webinar. I also want to thank behind the scenes, Galena and Yana, who are from Intelligence, did a great job organizing things and, and being able to help take care of the attendance and, and Q&A throughout the session as well. Thank both of you as well, who are working hard uh, out there. And Annette, once again, thanks for being involved with this webinar. And also, too, if you want to find out more about uh, Annette or be able to follow her, she has a wonderful blog, right, the, C uh, the CX Journey blog. And I know you constantly post on Twitter and LinkedIn as well. I'm a big fan of yours going forward. So I encourage everybody to sign up for those and, and keep following Annette's, uh, you know, insights when it comes to the customer experience journey. All right, so thanks, everyone, for, for being a part of this webinar. I look forward to uh, seeing you again in a couple of months for the next one. All right, take care. And on behalf of Intelligence and 8x8, I'm Mike Aoki, and uh, we're signing off now. Take care. Bye.